Good morning, ladies and, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Centum Investor Briefing for the year ended 31st March 2022. I'm joined by my colleague uh, Rispa Alaro, our CFO. We'll do the presentation uh, together. I hope I'm audible. Thank you very much. So we'll start off with a business review, which I will uh, present. Uh, just a recap about our business uh, model. It's, uh, the focus is on, that's a value wheel, uh, driven by creating value in the investees, and I'll be speaking a bit more about that in a bit of, of detail. Growing the value of those investees, eventually exiting, uh, di distributing some of that capital as a dividend, and reinvesting the rest into new companies that you can then create into additional value. That's really the focus of this, uh, of this business. In terms of the highlights, market capitalization, 6.6 .6 billion shillings. Net asset value at 41.3 billion, which translates to an NAV per share of 62 shillings and 10 cents. NAV growth, 3.3 uh, times. Uh, retained earnings, 22 billion. Cost to income, uh, as RISPA will be presenting our financials, you'll see it down to 39%, uh, down from 46%. Long-term gearing at uh, 0% and the, the credit rating at uh, A+. Plus. Um, this, this, are, this are a background of what, what really we've been working on from 2011. So from an NAV perspective, start around 12 billion. Uh, net value uplift around 11.2 uh, billion. We've had retained earnings. A dividend payout of 4.4 billion. That takes us to 41 billion. And we've been focusing in the last uh, three years to deleverage the, the balance sheet. As some of you are aware, those who have had uh, shares in Centum for a while or who have been following Centum for a while, the growth from 2011 has largely been organically funded. So through capital appreciation of portfolio companies exiting and recycling that capital and through the use of, of leverage at, at the peak were around 16 billion based on our view of the market outlook, we took a decision to deleverage so that we could protect the NAV. And, uh, and so rather than focus on just uh, total asset growth, focus on protecting a uh, net asset value per share. And I'll be speaking about more about where we are on that, uh, on that process. From a strategy update perspective, we had um, a, a number of pillars that I'll speak about. One is balance sheet uh, strengthening and deleverage to, and building up of liquidity. So in the period we've maintained zero long-term debt at, at company level, in line with our 4.2 delivery gym objective. Um, we also had some of the off-balance sheet guarantees dropping off. We did communicate at the beginning of Centum 4.2 that we're not looking at adding more uh, recourse debt or guaranteed debt uh, in portfolio companies at, at Centum level. And this dropped off following the completion of one of the cases, which was a case that related to excess claim against one of our former portfolio companies, the, the bottlers, and where as part of the exit we are required to provide this uh, guarantee to the to the purchaser. And this case was concluded late last year and this guarantee dropped off, uh, which reduced the contingent liability to by 2.7 billion shillings. We've been building up our marketable securities uh, portfolio. Uh, when we started the process, we're around 3% of total assets. This has come up to around 15% of the total portfolio. And the objective of this has been to build the annuity income. So we took a view in 2019, a view that has been proven right, that market conditions are going to be very challenging, and that it made sense to deploy some of our exit proceeds into the marketable securities portfolio, so as to earn a recurrent income, and then to base our dividend policy on that recurrent income even as we focused on the value creation opportunities and, and uh, strategy in the rest of the portfolio companies. In line with our active portfolio management approach, we have value creation strategies for each of these companies that we've been uh, working on. And these are uh, initiatives geared to enhancing the value of those, those companies so that they can either enhance the cash flow that they can distribute to Centum or enhance ultimately the, their exit valuation or evaluation at which another investor would come in. Uh, and of course, focusing on uh, shareholder shareholder return. 
a marketable securities portfolio have generated an annualized gross return of 14% per annum. And we've exceeded the NSC20 index by about, uh, which has performed at 13.4. So the objective with that portfolio is to ensure we consistently outperform the, the market and you'll see how we've allocated uh, the, the portfolio. In terms of the strategic uh, pillars for 2022-2024, uh, last year in June 2021, the board, we had a, a strategy review. This followed Corona and therefore we need to reconsider the, the assumptions we had made in respect of the operating environment and the outlook that we had initially, and then consider it in the context of our strategy. From so our strategy is in five pillars. One is to return and dividend uh, payout. On NAV, we are at um, eighty-six percent achievement. As at thirty-first March twenty two oh two, we are targeting to be at forty-one forty-seven point six billion. We are at forty-one billion. On uh, the issue of dividend payment, we did uh, reclarify the dividend policy and fixed it at thirty percent of cash annuity income. And the reason for that was to avoid distributing dividend out of capital. So make sure that we can distribute dividend out of the recurrent income of the company. Also so that we could ensure the sustainability of that dividend to avoid it fluctuating year to year. So vis-a-vis -vis our target of what we had expected to have distributed by now, we are at an 87% achievement. On the capital structure and liquidity, we set ourselves up an objective over the remaining three years of this strategy period was to pay down the balance of the debt of three billion shillings. We expect to pay down half of that debt before the end of this financial year using the proceeds of some of the exits that we have made once they complete. We also give ourselves a target to enhance the annuity income which is why we'll be allocating the balance of the proceeds from that exit to the MSP portfolio so that we can enhance the annuity income. On the operating cost objective, we gave ourselves an objective to come down to 30%. We are now at 39%. And, and part of the reason why we are not quite at 30% is because last financial year, we had a number of one-off costs which related to the restructuring of the business which was geared around the point around focus and organizational effectiveness, where we wanted all the companies to have separate and independent operation and governance structures, which is our point five at the very bottom. And that saw us uh, uh, restructure and, uh, and seize operations of center business solutions. And that cost us a bit of money in, in, in one of costs to achieve that. Otherwise, we would have been at 30%. This year, we expect to be around 32%. But that really depends on uh, the assumptions made around annuity income and how quickly we can complete those transactions and reallocate uh, capital. We also had a goal around portfolio focus. So about 75 to 80% of the assets should be within the private equity and about 20 to 30 within the MSP portfolio. We are largely there. To achieve this, we need to, to make further progress on our, on our value creation initiatives, uh, achieve exits, and then be able to reallocate reallocate the capital. And I'll be speaking a bit more where we are on that. That's the NAV. We, we had an objective to preserve value, even as we continue to work on the underlying portfolio companies. I think that objective has been more or less uh, achieved if you look at that, that bar chart. Um, given the turbulent period we've had from 2020 to 2022, the objective was to preserve as much value as you can, we had some markdowns, and, and I think the most significant markdown there is Amu Power. We've also had some revaluation losses. These are unrealized losses of portfolio companies. But as we get to the market to undertake transactions, we are seeing some of them unwinding. An example is CDN Bank, which we are currently carrying at 2.7 billion, and which we have signed an agreement to sell at 4.3 billion shillings, which is uh, 1.6 billion higher than the current value. So some of these uh, impairments and, and revaluations are, are, are temporary and they're just uh, sort of underpinned by, by prudence in terms of what we, what we carry those, those, those assets at. 
the total return statement and, and RISPA will speak more about this in the financial presentation. Uh, this is this for us is really what is critical. So you, we have three lines. This is dividend and interest income. This is what you'd consider recurrent, uh, recurrent income from the portfolio. You have other investment income. This is largely non-recurrent uh, income. It may relate to capital gains and other one-off uh, income lines. What our objective has been has been to grow dividend and interest income. And, and that growth is twofold, largely from the MSP portfolio, secondly, from the underlying portfolio companies. With COVID, what happened is that many of the portfolio companies, one of the first areas they cut was, was, was dividend. And, and, and therefore, the MSP portfolio has come in handy for us. The other line is operating expenses that we've been working on reducing, as I've explained, come down from 669 million to 529 million. We also had an objective of re reducing debt so that you could reduce the finance costs. And those have come down by 10% this year. As we further reduce debt in the coming year, this number we expect it to, to decline. So as a result, the cash operating profit improved by 142% from 245 to 592 million. And this is a source of cash flow to pay uh, the dividend. This is where the dividend comes from. So the, the, the logic of this was that we wanted to be able to meet our operating expenses as a company, finance cost and dividend from recurrent income so that we do not quite touch the capital. And therefore, any exits that happen then go towards reallocation into various uh, asset classes. And I'll also speak about, uh, some of you have asked me about the subject of share buybacks. That was part of the reallocation because that is, we considered it as an investment. You then have impairment of assets, which is an uncash line, which is 531 million. So this impairment is when you have revaluations that are below cost. Those typically tend to go through impairments. And then unrealized gains and losses are, are, are really other comprehensive income. If you, are, if you have made previous gains and you are now revaluing it lower than what it was previously, when you have set that, it comes out through the unrealized gains and losses. So total return for the year was negative 248. So as a percentage of opening NAV, it is 0.6%. Relative to last year, it's a significant improvement. But more importantly, the operating profit has significantly uh, improved. Now I want to speak about the portfolio and, and what we are doing with the various uh, businesses. So I just want to use a case study uh, just to explain the drivers of value for our businesses and why we've taken some of the decisions we've taken. So the principal driver of value in our business is ability to grow a free cash flow. So what we look at as a proxy of free cash flow is EBITDA, which is earnings before interest tax depreciation and amortization. Most valuations are done based on the earning potential of the underlying business. So the key value creation initiative is around geared around uh, to what extent can you grow EBITDA of, of free cash flow? So we, we, I just said to use this as a case study just to illustrate um, this particular use to use this particular example. So for example, in 2013, EBITDA here was 600 million shillings. By 2018, we had grown it three times to 1.8 billion shillings. And we we're able to achieve an exit at 10 and a half times EBITDA. So you have the return is then pegged on the higher EBITDA that you have achieved. So each of our value creation strategy is geared towards enhancing the free cash flow number because that is the driver of the valuation. And that's what we look at in determining whether the portfolio is moving in the right direction or not, because it then that's a number that determines how much dividend you can earn from the company and what that company is worth should you go to the market for an exit. Now, we have smaller companies that uh, have gone through the, the similar journey, and, and I wanted to use the example of Gen Africa just to illustrate and compare with some of the smaller companies that we have. So, Gen Africa, we started off at uh, 100 million shillings, that was the PAT. And by the time we exited, it was 152 million shillings. And we exited our 74% stake, just shy of uh, 2.4 billion shillings but we ended up at around 153 million shillings. So the point here is that even though the profitability may appear small, because of the fact that when you exit, you exit at a multiple to that profitability, 
that growth, although appearing small in absolute terms, can be quite significant from a capital gain uh, perspective. So with, with, with that in mind, I can then speak about some of our portfolio companies uh, and, and sort of share where we are on that on that journey. I'll start off with St. Amri. They had their investor briefing yesterday and the management team there went into the detail of the operation. So I want to focus on it from, from an investor as opposed to, to an operator. So what we've been working on in that business is, is growing the free cash flow number, free cash flow from operations. So prior to 2019, uh, we were losing money on a free cash flow, largely because we're in the investment phase. We were spending more money. The, the business was deploying more capital than it was generating. So free cash flow in 2020 was negative 651 million. Last year, we, we sort of broke even, we were at 37 million shillings. And this year, they were at 1.3 billion shillings. So if you relate to where St. Amri is relative to, say, an Almasi when we exited, Almasi was at 1.8 billion shillings. This is at 1.3 billion shillings. Now, what excites us about this business is that if you, looked at the, if you look at the locked value of their contracts, um, in terms of sale of development rights. So there are two sources of cash flow. One is sale of development rights and the other is sale of residential units. Now the sale of development rights you may consider to be a one-off because the development rights are finite. Um, but sale of, of, of units is, is not a finite business, it's a continuous uh, business. So when you look at the sales done, less what has been received so then you have the receivable what is to be received in the future less the cost to completion for the various projects the, the immediate profitability in the ongoing projects about six and a half billion shillings and that should, those should be completed in the next 36 months then when you add the signed value of the contracts on development rights so what tends to happen is that when purchasers acquire development rights from Santa Marie, they get into contracts and they pay for those contracts over a period of time. Uh, buyers tend to have terms. And so those, those, those sales are only recognized in their p and once they've been completed. That is that, so those sales account for about 4 billion shillings. So in aggregate, the locked free cash flow in this business so far is 10.6 billion, and that number is, uh, is, is growing. So we can expect this 1.2 billion to almost double next year and to continue to grow as sort of sort of as this business um, gets gets larger so what is interesting for us in this business is that it's now out of the cash consumptive phase which is what enabled them to reduce to make principal reductions to their borrowings last year where they distributed some of this free cash flow back to borrowing some of it is lending from the from from centum itself which they were able to pay back um, to pay back interest but from the three pillars of value that we look at, one is a bill to grow sales. We see significant scope to grow, for this business to grow its sales, both on development rights and also on, um, on, 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 on residential units, especially as they focus on the mid-market uh, market segment. The second level of value is ability to enhance margins. There is significant scope based on the recent work that this company has been doing around the scope to enhance margins especially looking at the design and just the whole procurement process and how we contract. And, and, and the significant scope there to enhance margins without taking up price. They don't want to take up price because they want to remain uh, competitive in the market. And then of course, the capital efficiency of the business, just the, the, the model they use, which is a pre-sale model, reduces the capital intensity of, of this business. Now, if we were to exit in the future, any exit would then be on the basis of a DC evaluation. Or, or, or a multiple of this, uh, of this free cash flow. So we are currently carrying this asset at around 16 billion shillings. Um, that's that's the equity value. And you can see where we are, it's around 1.2. Maybe next year it'll be around between 2.5 and 3 billion. So it's trending in the right direction in our, in, 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 in our view, and it's a business we're excited about that can be quite scalable without now requiring additional capital from, um, from, from Centum, which is, uh, where we are currently the only shareholder in this in this business. So these are some of the metrics which are also available in the St. Amri uh, presentation. Now TRDL is is not part of St. Amri. It is a standalone subsidiary. We own 58% of this um, of this subsidiary. We have other other investors, 
So when we did the reorganization of St. Ambri, we kept it separate, largely because uh, we were in the process of doing a separate transaction at uh, at TRDL, which which uh, for for various reasons related to what happened with the pandemic, did not did not close. Uh, but having said that, the market opportunity for for TRDL is is in the mid market uh, mid market segment. If you think about the number of households that can afford rent of between twenty thousand and fifty thousand in the two rivers location, the the market research we have now it's it's a very substantial. A market market opportunity. So we've tested the market at various price points, and and where there is scope for significant scalability is in that price point where you're doing a value product, and so that that the focus is on the Mzizi the Mzizi code product. The what was introduced to test the market was fully sold out within a couple of of weeks. Those were 272 units. There is potential to do almost 9,000 units in within within two rivers. So the, the objective now is for two rivers to focus on that. And on the back of that opportunity, we are in the process of raising equity, which we hope to conclude within this financial year, within two rivers to enable them actualize that particular opportunity. There's about 50 acres uh, of land that is serviced where you can develop. So if you think about from an, any alternative site with as large uh, developable potential, uh, Two Rivers is probably one of the few sites where you have significant uh, scope for for development and where the infrastructure has already been provided and which is very well served from a connectivity uh, perspective. So, so, so it's, 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 fairly, it's fairly central. So I, I believe we have, that business now has the right, the right product. There's significant investor, investor interest and there are a number of engagements going on uh, with, with two rivers. For now, what we've done is that that development opportunity has been actualized by St. Ambri through a JV partnership between St. Ambri and, uh, and, and two rivers. And even when we do close this equity race, uh, St. Ambri will remain the development partner for, 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 for two rivers. Obviously, as you add more households uh, living in two rivers, that then also has an impact on the performance of the, of the, of the shopping center, which will then have a captive, a captive market within, within the two rivers, within the two rivers mode. So that's one of the, that's what we are doing on that particular uh, asset. We, we've indicated at the top right screen, and, and this presentation is available, what the average selling price of developable bulk has been, vis-a-vis -vis the average culling value. So we are carrying it at around half of what we have realized when we have sold. Now, a number of you have asked, and we'll discuss this, of the data to reverse what quantum is with recourse to centum. So when we started off, it was about $32 million. That is now down to $25 million. And the idea was with what we want to do with the TRDL, what the shareholders of TRDL want to do, is to bring in equity to extinguish the debt in its entirety, and therefore dilute all the existing uh, uh, investors, and then pursue a development model on a, on, on a debt-free balance sheet. Now, in the interim, because it's a subsidiary of Centum and we carry 58% of it, we're then consolidating 100% of its performance in the P&L of, uh, of, uh, of, of Centum, as if we own 100% of that, of, that, of that business. And that is the impact um, that you see in the consolidated financial statements. CDN Bank, around Back to my original thesis, the, the, our focus is to grow underlying profitability of the businesses because we believe that is the principal driver of value. But then that is then driven by the value drivers, which is asset growth, which is customer growth, which is customer deposit. So you have a number of metrics that we've been working on. But that slide, the extreme right slide, shows you how we've performed in terms of growing the underlying performance. So uh, three years ago, we were losing money in that business. Uh, we made a loss of 4.6, now we down to 3.78, went to 112, 19, and this year we had, last year we had 486 million shillings. Now the constraint for CDN Bank, which is a regulated entity, which is not a constraint you have with non-regulated entities, is that now future growth there is really driven by the need to provide additional capital. 
and 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 then that would mean that you have to as an investor uh, exit maybe either your msp portfolio or exit another asset to provide that particular entity with additional capital or or allow dilution by allowing other investors to come in and provide a minority a minority stake in the in, in the business but given where we are from a capital ratio perspective future growth that that growth trajectory was no longer possible without an injection of, of capital so what we then opted to do was to exit at this point and i've discussed this in previous presentations but again back to the to the impact of profitability when we exited we exited at around 10 and a half times uh, the, the profit of the business in, in 2021 which, were, which which in our view was a was a reasonable exit exit value now that is then going to be reallocated to the two objectives that we had which was one uh, debt reduction uh, so that you could reduce finance costs and two increasing the msp portfolio so that you can increase the annuity income which is a primary driver of, uh, of, of, of dividend so <clears throat> a number of a number of shareholders have asked and we're just responding to shareholder queries how we performed on this investment relative to the market so we went back to 2014 when we came in and looked at the entire banking sector just selected companies that are listed and said that we instead of buying CDN acquired any of the other listed entities uh, how would we have done had we held it from March 2014 when we got into CDN to June 2022 uh, when we signed the agreement to to exit and and the average return of, of those banks has been negative 44 percent and, and and the reason why the banks have not done as well is because of the various changes that have happened in the, in the macro environment and in the regulatory and, and environment around uh, especially around pricing uh, issues around uh, cost of funds um, issues around just the general economic environment around npls and what that has done in terms of uh, the capital requirements that banks have needed to hold so it's been a challenging sector to create value in and so cdn is not um, is not unique i think there's still uh, an opportunity there but it's an opportunity that can probably be best actualized with, with, with scale with a significantly larger larger entity because now it's an economies of scale uh, business long on publishers um uh, again the strategy is to expand profitability so as to drive uh, underlying uh, underlying value so here we focused on expanding into into new markets um because once you have the intellectual property which is the, the published works you, the, the, the barriers to entry into new markets and, and significantly reduce uh, expanding on uh, digital digital channels so it's been a regional growth strategy geographical diversification and also product uh, diversification we've seen a uh, profit growth unfortunately that profit growth has not been translated into growth in the value of the of the entity and um, the shareholders and the board there are considering uh, different options on how to unlock the embedded value in this in this in this company which is listed issues with africa uh, for the companies that we own that are subsidiaries of centum we are at liberty to provide uh, information around the underlying profitability and the trend but for companies like issues which are not subsidiaries we are restricted in how much information we can provide because the other partners in those business are not key in the numbers being public so what we can share with you is what we are allowed to share with the public and that is market share market share has been going up as a result net profit has gone up 40 percent net sales has gone up 50 uh, percent and that has been the driver of the of, 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 of the value improvements in that business the same story with isuzu applies to nas again we are not at liberty to share detailed numbers just as i've shared with you the rest of the of the companies but again there we've seen a strong recovery uh, this business was significantly affected by by COVID when uh, travel reduced but we've seen a recovery of travel and it's back to to, to profitability revenue is up 54 percent in q1 gross profit is up 54 uh, percent um, I, I, this time around i thought i would share would share some information about some of our smaller businesses so you may recall that we opted that rather than uh, go out and acquire small businesses we, we, we just establish greenfield uh, entities from scratch we thought it was a cheaper way of um, 
of establishing companies because at that time the valuations were very, very steep. So one of the areas we ventured into was agriculture and this was a green field. So there was absolutely nothing, no land, no, no management and these are business we've been building from scratch. So as at the end of 2022, although the profit was 24 million, in the last six months, it was around 48 million. So if you annualize it's 96, 96 million. And, and the reason for that was largely because of just water issues we had, which were, which were resolved. And this year we are projecting this business closing at around 132 million, million shillings. We are carrying it at 270 million, which is largely the cost of establishment. We are now at around 132 million shillings. So if you assume, say, a valuation even of 6x, we are talking of close to 900 million shillings. Uh, this business has significant room for, for further growth. What now constrains the growth is just the rate of rollout of how quickly you can expand uh, production, which takes a bit, of, uh, a bit of time. But also it has a competitive advantage in the sense that it is now establishing in the sites where we have uh, land that is not utilized and that is not subject to a sale. They can use that land to expand, uh, to expand production. So it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a greenfield venture for us. So it's sort of, I want you to compare this with Jan Africa, which when we exited it was around 150 million shillings. We believe this business can be 400 million shillings in the next two years, just based on the plan we have. And so it can be a significant drive of value in, uh, in coming years. Another business that we've not shared much in the past is our, is our leasing business. We, again, we established this from scratch. 2022 EBITDA was 56, this year is going to be around 99. It's again scaling up, we are carrying it at 245 million, which is again at, at cost. So it's around 4.3 times uh, EBITDA. So we're just working on uh, scaling up uh, this, 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 you know, this, this business and it can be potentially a business that can be valued at a billion, two billion, and, and, and down the line one can, can, can achieve a reasonable exit. Uh, not having invested significant amount of, of capital up front. We've also established a number of other smaller businesses which are sort of off the St. Amri eco ecosystem. And uh, those two are tier data and Tribus. So tier data is a technology business. Uh, it offers technology solutions around um, assurance solutions for uh, utility metering. So large scale water meters, electricity billing, uh, CRM, customer relationship uh, management uh, systems, uh, ISPs, etc. And uh, initially it was focused on largely on the St. Amri ecosystem. Uh, they have diversified to other, to, other, to other clients. They are currently at uh, 30 million shillings uh, and it's a business that we project should be well over 100 million shillings in, in due course. And of course as St. Amri scales up, it has, it, has, it has a captive market that can enable it to scale up uh, significantly. The same applies with, with the Tribus, which is a facilities uh, management company, for security and facilities management company. So again, started off with a captive market, diversified to other clients, uh, but again, with significant potential to scale up as, 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 as St. Amri scales up its operations, especially as St. Amri pivots towards, um, also now that they have completed units, uh, venturing into property management, so that they can be able to offer an end-to-end -end solution. To their to their clients, uh, because ultimately the end customers to be satisfied, and, and 90, 80, over eighty percent of their buyers are, are 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 investors. So these are some of the smaller companies we've created. On the marketable securities portfolio, we last year we were at seven point five billion. This year we were at, we closed at seven point two five billion. So there was a slight reduction of two hundred, and that was largely on account of cash that we reallocated from MSP for equity investments in uh, some of the portfolio companies. So we made some, uh, some small equity investments, uh, the bulk of which was in Sidian Bank, which was to enable it to meet its capital, capital ratios, uh, uh, sort of to, to, to bridge that, but more or less kept it uh, the same. I think the additional disclosure we've made here is some of you have asked us how much of this fixed income is invested in related parties. So we've made that disclosure there. So it's about 1.7 billion of the 7.2 is invested in commercial paper of related uh, parties. That, and then the balance, about 5.4, is, is to external 
is to external parties. So this this is typically a moving moving target. It, it, it fluctuates, it increases, it, it, it reduces. But these are source of uh, cash flow for for the business and for the portfolio the portfolio companies. The the one thing that we've been doing recently, and we'll speak about that around management of FX risk, is around pivoting the government fixed income portfolio, which was largely in case to 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 euro bond, uh, just to take advantage of the higher euro bond euro bond yields. So that is something that we've been working on uh, progressively. But that figure is not is not split, so it's still uh, it's still cumulative. And of course, the other thing we've done is that we've significantly reduced our exposure to listed equities, largely because our views that was that with the volatility, you are not quite certain whether you can preserve capital, given the high volatility in, uh, in listed in listed equities. So MSP returns in aggregate closed at 16.7% uh, against uh, the index around 5.2. So an outperformance of 11%. Uh, 11, 11%. ESG uh, considerations in a, in a, in a snapshot, uh, we involved in a number of activities. Uh, from a gender diversity perspective, uh, this both at the board level and at management level. 40% uh, of the board of directors is, uh, is made up of, of women. Uh, education is another pillar we focus on. So again, award of uh, scholarships, and this we support our various portfolio companies. Over 300 high school scholarships have been advanced. Uh, water and waste water management is again something we've done, uh, again supporting our portfolio companies. So we, in, in the Pingo, we are providing water from the desalination plant to, to the neighboring communities. We're doing the same here in two rivers with, uh, with Gedogoro and a number of other initiatives. And of course, uh, the, the, the green energy uh, agenda. Which, which cuts across all our portfolio uh, companies. So I want to stop there and uh, hand over to, to Rispa to share the financial performance. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, James, and good morning all. Uh, following that background that James has provided insofar as the business is concerned, I will then now just take you through the financial performance uh, of Centum for the financial year ended uh, March 2022. And let me start with the company performance and just give you a bit of context. Um, so for us, the company performance is representative of Centum as an investment holding company. Um, you know, we take the dividend and interest income net of our operating and finance costs, and that then constitutes our operating profit. Um, in the balance sheet, we hold our investments at fair value, and then any value movements in the period are then passed through uh, the OCI, and, and specifically this is the unrealized value within the, within the period. So specifically for the financial year under review, we recorded a 142% growth in operating profit, um, from, 500 and, from 245 million last year to 592 million in the year under review. This was really on the back of a 10% increase in total income uh, from 1.5 billion shillings to about 1.7 billion shillings. James already mentioned the profitability or the return that we generated from the MSP portfolio of about 14%, which was largely the driver of, of this increase in, in income. Operating costs were contained, um, and we began to realize the efficiencies following the restructuring of the business that was done last year. Finance cost, uh, a slight dip, uh, reflective of uh, you know, uh, pay downs in, in our debt um, to close at 540 million shillings. We made impairments in the period of about half a billion shillings, and these are really conservative estimates um, of a realizable value of, of assets within our balance sheet. So that said, then the profit after tax then stood at a loss of 21 million shillings, uh, which was an improvement compared to a loss of 600 million shillings in prior year. The unrealized value gains line, as I mentioned earlier, is just reflective of the value movements within, within the period. Uh, the, the improvement in performance, as you see, at 200 and 
uh, 27 um, million is really reflective of uh, an improvement in performance of our unquoted portfolio. So total return for the year, um, an increase of 95% and return on opening NAV stood at uh, negative 6%, 0.6% compared to negative 10% in, in the prior year. So moving to the company statement of financial position, our total assets remained relatively unchanged. And I just want to mention that in the period, we are holding our investment in CDN uh, as an asset held for sale. And so that amount that you see there, 2.8 billion shillings in the previous period was included in, um, in, in, in the investment in subsidiaries line. Uh, just to mention that we're expecting proceeds to the tune of 4.3 billion shillings in, in relation to this particular exit, and we look to deploy this towards reduction in debt, as well as um, increase our investment in our MSP portfolio. Um, in the holding period um, for the CDN investment, we did not receive any cash returns. Um, our MSP portfolio stood at 7.2 billion shillings compared to 7.5 billion shillings in the in the prior period and as james mentioned relatively flat with swings within their location and um, we part of that um, part of the msp portfolio was allocated reallocated into our investment in subsidiaries during the period so shareholder funds are relatively flat at 4.1 41.3 billion shillings compared to 41.8 billion in the prior period um, resulting in an NFV per share of 62 shillings and 10 cents um, compared to 62 shillings and 85 cents in the prior period this represents our cash flow statement um, and this is again from a company perspective so net cash generated from operations in the period is 1.2 billion shillings and i'd just like to mention that this is really on the back of uh, improved um, return, cash return from, from our portfolio, especially the MSP portfolio. And uh, the prior year period stood at 4.5 billion shillings and inclusive in that amount was an amount of about 3.5 billion that we received as a repayment of a shareholder loan to Vipingo Development Limited. Uh, we made an investment in subsidiaries, specifically Cydian, to the tune of 183 million shillings in the period. And uh, then the various allocations within the MSP portfolio are highlighted there to, to arrive at a net cash used in investing activities of uh, 460 uh, negative uh, compared to 2 billion shillings in the prior year. Our borrowings um, remained flat, but in the prior period, we paid down um, the, the corporate bond, as well as, um, uh, you know, put in place an RCF facility with Stanbic Bank. So our net cash at the end of the period stood at 10 million shillings compared to a negative position of 149 million shillings in the prior period. So that's the company performance and I'll move on to the consolidated financial statements. And before I start, I just want to mention that our consolidated performance aggregates line by line the performance of our subsidiaries. Um, and in, these are in five segments. So we have our trading business, which includes our investments in Longhorn, in Tier Data, in Greenblade, as well as Tribus. We have our financial services segment, which includes our business performance of our business in Cedian Bank in Nabo Capital, as well as Zohari Leasing Company. Then we have the uh, Centum Re, uh, as well as the Two Rivers Development Subgroup. And lastly, our trading, our operating uh, segment, which includes performance of Centum Investment, uh, uh, CBS, which now has ceased operation, as well as Investpool, which is our holding company for our investment in Akira. So that said, we recorded a 110% improvement in profitability in the period. 
with total comprehensive income for the year standing at a profit of 142 million shillings compared to a 1.5 billion um, negative comprehensive income position in the last financial year. Now this performance was driven and James had mentioned in detail about the performance of uh, the portfolio companies. So this performance was driven by an improvement in performance of our financial services businesses, as well as our trading businesses. I must say that also our real estate business uh, recorded um, significant improvement in performance, um, but then the profit that we took from the residential sales unit only comprised of the what was completely what was completed and handed over. So there's an element of the sales that is sitting within the balance sheet of St. Amri. On the two rivers development, we recorded a 1.9 billion loss. And this is really on account of the finance cost incurred in the business, both at the Two Rivers holding company uh, company level, as well as Two Rivers Lifestyle, which is a subsidiary of, of Two Rivers um, Development. On the trading, on, on our investment operations, we recorded an improvement in performance uh, insofar as the income is concerned. But as James mentioned, we took, um, into account uh, or adjusted for fair uh, you know, provisions on account of conservative assessment of realize, realized value um, in some of our portfolio assets. So net, our position for the year stood at um, 1.6 billion shillings before tax. Uh, compared and uh, which is a loss compared to a loss of 2.3 billion shillings in the prior year in so far, and then total comprehensive income for the year stood at 142 million shillings compared to 1.4 billion shillings in, in the in the prior year there's a line there of other comprehensive um, income which really reflects the value movements in the period insofar as um, the our unquoted business uh, valuation is concerned, and and that really rep is representative of the improvement in in value of our unquoted portfolio. Now, this particular slide just gives a flavor of how the performance looks like um, when we disaggregate and 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 uh, without uh, Two Rivers Development Limited's performance, as I'd mentioned. Uh, Two Rivers Development recorded a loss of 1.9 billion shillings compared to 1.8 in the previous year. Now, excluding this performance of um, Two Rivers, you can see that we recorded a consolidated profit before tax of 343, um, 343 million shillings compared to uh, a loss last year of 472 million shillings. And as James mentioned in his presentation, there's a lot that's being done in, in the Two Rivers uh, Development Subgroup. Um, you know, just one to, to restructure the, the balance sheet from a capital structure, as well as uh, to, to the partnership with um, Centum Re insofar as development of uh, residential units, where we see a huge potential uh, for growth. That's the consolidated financial uh, position in, in a group from a group perspective. I won't go into details, but just mention that this is really a, just a line, line by line consolidation. And for us, the company statement of financial position is a better representation of the value and the position of Centum. James spoke about group debt. And this particular slide just highlights um, the debt levels at each of the subsidiary companies. So our net debt position stood at 20 billion, shil 20 million shillings compared to 25 million shillings in the, in the previous period, billion shillings in the, prior, in the previous period. At centum level, the debt was 4 billion shillings. This remained flat uh, and inclusive of our Debt facility with CDN, uh, with CDN, with Stanbic Bank. Sorry, um, at Longhorn, the debt position was one billion shillings, and the de decline from the previous period just shows a, a payback of debt within the period. Same to Centum Re, 
the debt position stood at 5.2 compared to 6 billion last year um, as debt was repaid in the period. Uh, insofar as the, the makeup of this debt, about 9.4 um, billion of the debt is, do is dollar denominated and the rest being cash denominated. And James spoke about this exposure and a lot is being done insofar as mitigating the risks around um, the FX movements that we have seen over the year. So at CACP level, a key focus for us is uh, currently to pay down the debt and we will utilize the proceeds that we will receive from the sale of Cydian to do this. Um, in addition to that, we have relocated a part of our MSP portfolio into USD assets and this for us covers us insofar as debt service is concerned. The debt at two rivers level, a lot is being done again insofar as the capital structure and we look to significantly restructure this uh, during the year um, from debt into equity. So in terms of the coverage of debt, um, very good cover across the, the portfolio, uh, save for Two Rivers development and, and as I mentioned, uh, there are initiatives in place to resolve this. So moving on to, uh, to the dividend, based on, based on our policy to pay out 30% of our annuity income, um, the company will be proposing a dividend payout to the tune of 391 million shillings. And this is reflective of 30% of the annuity income that we had generated in the year of 1.3 billion shillings. Insofar as dividend per share is concerned, this translates to 0 0.587 uh, per share. And this is up 78% from the dividend payout of 33 cents in the previous year. And from a yield perspective, this respect, uh, represents a 6% yield on payout. So that brings me to the end of my presentation and I will hand back to James to cover the outlook. Thank you very much, uh, Rispa, for that uh, presentation. Um, in terms of uh, uh, outlook, we have a number of, of, of initiatives across the, the various uh, portfolio companies. On uh, TRDL, I think something we did not mention, if you look at the, the performance, it's been split between our joint venture, which is uh, the joint venture between TRDL and All Mutual, which is TRLC and TRDL itself. On TRLC, we completed the restructure in December of last year, and so looking into the first, into the last quarter of the last financial year, uh, that business is now profitable, so we don't have an issue there. So the only missing piece that we are working on this year is the TRDL, is the TRDL uh, piece. We are supporting management um, to further optimize their their businesses and um, in line with the various value creation uh, initiatives that we that we have. We are working on completing the sale of uh, Cidian Bank, which we expect to close within this calendar calendar year in the next couple of uh, months. So currently going through the, 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 approval, the approval processes. 
uh, on marketable securities, we are working on a uh, part of that shift, um, sort of optimizing that, um, that, that portfolio. There are also initiatives happening at um, St. Amri, which will see us repaid a substantial portion of our shareholder loan. We were paid some of it in 2020, and we're expecting, expected to be paid the balance in 2023, uh, about $50 million or substantial portion of that $50 million. And that is meant to beef up the MSP portfolio or be allocated towards uh, private private equity. As we grow the, 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 the recurrent income, we, we, we expect uh, from a cost efficiency target will come down to around 30%. Part of that um, inflows from some of those activities we are doing from a capital structure perspective, once we address the debt issue, we had a discussion at the board level around the share buyback uh, issue. It's a capital structure, it's a capital allocation issue. So as we get exits or repayments of, of shareholder, shareholder loans, then part of that capital can be allocated also towards buying back some of our, of our shares and we had a discussion around how to do it. So we then also have engagements with the, with the regulator because it's a bit different from what is currently provided in the, in, in the regulations, what we think needs to be done to address the current uh, situation. And of course, in the short run, the objective is to continue to target a distribution of 30% of annuity cash income in line with the, with the, with the, with, with the policy, but also to, to continue to grow that annuity cash income so that then you can have a sustainable growth in, the, in, dividend, in dividend income. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We'll now open up the session to Q&A. Thank Okay, I think I've seen the first question by Nikki Tonga, uh, sort of. Um, are you investing in Kenya and SSA Euro bonds? Uh, yes, we are. That is part of what the MSP portfolio is doing. Uh, in fact, they've been invested in, uh, in local currency denominated Euro bonds across uh, a number of African markets, uh, but the yields have recently gone up on the Euro bond uh, market. So yes, we are making those investments. Uh, what is the status of the? Can you read it? Yeah. Kevin, say what is the status of the transaction by the Luxembourg-based fund into Santa Maria that was muted last year? This is actually muted at the beginning of this year. So what uh, um, uh, Jim? Uh, Global Imagine Market wanted to do is to take uh, up to 20% stake in Saint Amri for no more than uh, for a 17 billion investment upon its listing. So there's obviously work that we need to do. They provided that uh, we there was no deadline when we need to list, and we were open to draw down on those funds within 36 months of listing. Now the work that needed to be done within Saint Amri was to move towards it being free cash flow positive, which is what you've seen we are doing. So that should you do a listing, you will then have a, an attractive valuation should you list in an international in an international market. So we're still very much in touch with, uh, with, with GEM and having various uh, discussion, they're monitoring the progress of, uh, of, 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 of St. Amri and at an appropriate time, should we list, then we have that option to draw down up to $17 million uh, one, 17 billion shillings of new capital into, into St. Ambri to support that growth. Does the unprofitability of St. Ambri affect the agreement with Jem? Is it as per the condition pres, uh, precedent? Uh, it, let me discuss the issue. Does the CRE bond constitute related party corporate FI held in MSP? So somebody has asked, uh, does the CRE bond constitute related party corporate FI held in MSP? Yes, we do hold uh, a portion of the of the Santa Marie bond, and that is included as part of, of related party uh, equity. You've stated that the shareholder loan will be paid before external loans. Uh, sorry, uh, Sunil has asked a question. Equity 
However, in your presentation, you've stated that shareholder will be paid before its kernel loans. The reported debt equity ratio of Santa Maria needs to be restated. Uh, okay, so 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 Sunil, the, the point is that when you invest in some of these companies, you don't put all the money as capital. You provide some of it as shareholder loans so that once they're in a position to go and raise their own capital, whether debt or equity, they're then able to, to repay you without being caught up in the, in the trap around retained, retained earnings. Because if you capitalize all of it, it's quite difficult for that entity to be able to repay you. So some of the discussions that St. Ambrie is having with investors, should they raise that capital, part of the use of proceeds is to repay the shareholder loan to, to St. Uh, CRE reported an increase in shareholder loans. Did St. Ambrie inject more money in St. Ambrie? No. No, I think uh, the, the overall uh, loan position in CRE uh, came down. Uh, what assets do the payment provision for FY22 relate to? Respect, mm -hmm. can ask that question. Yeah. So the impairment of assets there was a con conservative markdown over investment in Akira mainly. So the way the way the discussion was with Jem, it was not so much based on the profitability, but the valuation is around the free cash flow of the organization and, and, and the projections around that free cash flow. So we are largely in line with what the expectations are. Now, what is the, what is sort of holding back the profitability of Santa Marie is because on the development right sales, where those sales are hugely cash generative. Because you, you've revalued the, the investment property, when you sell, you then offset the selling price less the revalued amount. So the impact on the profitability is quite, is quite, is quite limited. So the, the investor there is not looking at it from a book profitability point of view, but from a free cash flow uh, point of view. Any update on the debt to uh, any update? Any update on the net to equity swap on two rivers? So in two rivers, there were two assets. This is from Brian Mutuma. There's TRLC, which is a JV partner of TRDL, and that's what I explained. There was debt there, of um, which was reduced substantially last year under this arrangement. And what that has meant for TRLC is that in the last quarter of the year, they were profitable. So that we completed. For TRDL, we are not doing. For TRDL, we would have closed, but uh, due to various uh, market conditions, that has been delayed. So we are expecting to have closure or completion in this financial year, which will be an injection of equity to retire the, the debt. Okay, I think this question I've answered Sunil. The question, this question is on the equity participation in St. Amrie by the European Fund. I have explained that the European Fund gave St. Amrie uh, call an option to issue shares to them of up to 17 billion shillings once they list. So because they have not listed, we've not achieved that condition. And that option was open to St. Amri for 36 months post-listing. But to get to a listing, we needed to do some work, and that's a progress we are on to enhance the free cash flow of the business because any valuation of that business would then be based on the free cash flow. Thank you very much for the increasingly detailed reporting. Carry on with the value. Uh, okay. Uh, carry on with the value creation of the share price. I think this is more uh, of a comment from one of the shareholders on the on the, on the call. Uh, let's see if there's any other question. Um, is there any question you've not addressed? Yeah, please, if you have a question, uh, we, we just want to give it two minutes. Please post your question so that we can make sure we've answered uh, all the questions. 
It's a new question. Is is gem transaction exclusive? Are there any other roadshows to raise capital for Santa Marie? Yes, Santa Marie is in a, a number of discussions with a number of different uh, investors, and that is ongoing. Um, these are largely international investors, so these are offshore offshore discussions. Once they conclude, uh, there will be an appropriate announcement. The center I'm looking to offload other portfolio companies like uh, like Longhorn. Uh, what we are currently doing is creating value in a number of other companies. We still believe there is a significant value creation uh, potential available in, in, in a number of companies. So exit decisions are typically taken, like say in the case of CDN, where the view is that for you to achieve further growth, you need to inject either uh, significant additional capital. So, so, it's, so at the moment, uh, the answer is, is no. We are not looking to offload portfolio companies like Longhorn. How far along is the sinking fund that was sent up to pay the CRE bond? I think Chris, you're a better place to answer the question. Oh. Huh? So, so, so that sinking fund is 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 largely. Um, this question should have been asked yesterday to the Santa Maria management team, but uh, I can I can ask I can answer it. So what happens is that for the sale of the projects that were funded by the bond, uh, those go to the sinking fund. Uh, and the last I checked, uh, it's, it's adequately covered, and it's a significant portion of the redemption value of the, of, 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 of the bond. Can you please provide further on what challenges you're facing in implementing a share buyback? So, so, so some of the challenges, uh, Patel, that are there is, you know, the regulations provide that the buyback should be 10% above the share price, which obviously would not work in this circumstance. It would not be meaningful to offer to buy back shares at 10% at above the share price. So you'd sort of have to uh, deal with that as an issue. The, the, second, the second challenge is that what we think makes sense is to focus on the smaller share, shares so that those shareholders can have an, op an option to, to exit. So we have shareholders who hold between one share and 10,000 share, shares. Out of our register of 36,000 shareholders, there are 32,000 shareholders. But those shareholders hold 8% of the total shareholding of the company, which is about 56 million shares. Now, those shares account for the bulk of the trades that take place. So they're the ones that are setting the price. So any share buyback would like it to be targeted towards giving those shareholders who hold up to 10,000 shares an option to acquire, to, to sell their shares to the company. But then obviously the price would have to be at a reasonable premium to the current share price to give them an incentive. Now, from a capital allocation perspective, our view is that we want to do that as a capital allocation. So not to take the MSP money to do that, but rather to take some of the money we have from the other assets as we exit to do it. Because on the MSP side, we are at around 15% of, of AUM, whereas our target asset allocation is between 15 and 30%. So we don't want to allocate capital from MSP to do the share buyback. We want to allocate capital from some of the other assets as we do the exits to undertake this share buyback. So the other question is when, what, to what extent is the QR now written down in our books? So the current holding value is about 900 million. Yeah. From an investment of 1.6, you've written yeah. down about 800. Which is why we are working on some of the transactions which will see us be paid back some of our shareholder loans. Uh, and some of those shareholder loans are actually not part of the MSP portfolio. Actually, the bulk of the shareholder loans are not part of the MSP portfolio. They are just part of the, they are sitting under the investment portfolio. So as those loans get paid back, we want to utilize some of those funds to, 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 to undertake the share buyback. Are there any plans to increase or do deals in other PE transactions? Yes, there are plans to increase or do deals in other uh, PE, PE transactions. 
yes yes they are and the 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 Saint Amri team has been has been doing extensive work on that would the reverse stock stock split help make the share trading more in line with fundamentals i think you're talking about a consolidation of shares i think john is talking about would a reverse stock split help in uh, more in line with fundamentals I, i'm not sure john whether that would really be be, be, be helpful if we sort of consolidate the shares so that instead of having 10 shares you now have one share maybe it would make it a lot more 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 illiquid uh, so so i'm not sure about that it's not something we've given considerable thought but it's a it's a good point that we we'll probably uh, look at. Thanks for all that. Those questions. It's it's a very engaging session. Uh, let's allow uh, people. I think people are still asking questions. Let's allow the audience a bit more time to post more questions. So there are no more questions, at least none that are posted on the on the Q and A. I want to thank uh, all of you for for joining us uh, this morning for this investor briefing. I want to thank my my colleagues for all your hard work in a very difficult operating uh, uh, environment, and I want to thank my colleagues in the portfolio companies for the for the incredibly hard amount of work they have had to do, and also to thank my colleagues on the board. Uh, for, for the collaboration and support that we've had and to thank all our shareholders. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. This marks the end of today's investor presentation. This investor presentation will be posted on our website, so you'll be available to, to view it. We also have an investor relations uh, web uh, email address, which is? Which is investor relations at centum.co.ke should you feel that your question was not answered or or was not sort of clear please send your question there and we're always available also to meet with with investors so should you want to have a meeting with management you're most welcome to 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 sort of set it up with us either through uh, alfred or the Ambo who deals with investor relations or, or rispa alaro they'll be more than happy to arrange a meeting with you and myself and and other members of the management team to address any questions that you may you may have the the email address is right at the bottom investor relations at centum.co.ke thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for your kind attention and for your very warm uh, interaction and, and robust interaction where you've posted very relevant uh, questions it is my hope that we provided uh, answers not just the questions but the logic uh, underpinning some of the decisions that we have taken thank you very much and thank you very much respect